Well, good morning, Walden Church. Hey, do you remember a time when you were the happiest that you'd ever been? I mean, no cares in the world. Everything's going great. Maybe you're, I don't know, stretched out on the beach, no kids, holding the hand of the one you love, and you're thinking to yourself, life doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> Last week, we talked about joy. Hopefully, finding joy that God wants us to have, and we gave you a few suggestions, right? Adding a little bit more worship, right, to your week, adding a little bit more thankfulness to your week, and so I hope you had a joy-filled week. The Cowboys did better. <laughs> 20 to 17 over the Bengals. Gas prices even dropped a little. Maybe the road construction uh, isn't that bad. It didn't get as hot as we all expected. Life is good, isn't it? I mean, yes, but of course, Americans are still worried. In a poll that was conducted this year, they wanted to see what Americans were most worried about. And you'll probably agree, the answer was pretty straightforward. Inflation. In fact, 52% of Americans said the most important issue facing our country today was inflation. And it was uh, all Americans, really. Uh, Two-thirds of Republicans said it was the top issue, and about 50% of all independents and slightly more than 40% of Democrats. Inflation was the top response for all age groups, and for both men and women. And at the end of the month, yeah, it's harder to buy food, pay the bills, keep your kids clothed, keep shoes on your kids. Uh, no matter how much they raise wages, right, it never seems to uh, get ahead of cost. And I'm gonna be a really old man right now, and I'm gonna say, you kids have it easy. It was worse when I was growing up. Uh, back in the 80s, energy inflation was worse than it is right now. Increases in gas prices in 1982 was up 68%. Today, it was only 48%. And the cost of household energy for heat and electricity was up 27% in 1980 compared to 15% today. You kids don't know how good you have it. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're still all driving less. We're taking fewer vacations. We're being more uh, careful at the grocery store. And just, you know, to put it simply, Americans, we are watching what we spend. Of course, we're also worried about moral values and climate change and the state of schools and the soundness of our economy. And, you know, there's other things that we're concerned about, like health care and spending on schools and reducing the national debt. But don't worry. Don't worry. Our elected officials will get to the bottom of this mess. That's another thing that people are worried about. Overall, about half of adults, roughly 49%, say that in thinking about the future of the country, they are worried about uh, how the government in Washington works. And another 48% say they're worried about the ability of political leaders to solve our country's biggest problems. That's a great lead in because we're still talking about joy. So I wanted to look at a very popular command in the Bible that you and I probably don't obey. Today we'll be in Philippians chapter four. And this is written by Paul. Paul started more than a dozen churches. He was uh, traditionally considered the author of 13 different books in the Bible, which is more than any other biblical writer. And Paul is often considered one of the most influential figures in history. He had the greatest impact on the world's religious landscape almost as much as Jesus. And he is a person who is very familiar with finding joy where there seems to be none. And he says in Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. That's a command. Are you sure? Yeah, that's a command. 
Aren't commands more like, thou shalt not murder? Sure, but this is also a command because it's written in the imperative voice, right? Paul says, be glad always. In fact, this is so important and I want you to get this, so I'm going to say it again. Rejoice in God always. We read that and it doesn't feel like a command because it doesn't, it, it sounds too happy, right? Commands are supposed to be serious and sad. But this says, be happy. Most commands are like, don't drink or, or don't smoke or don't cuss or be faithful to your spouse. Don't sell your children into slavery. And I would argue that all of those uh, traditional commands, uh, a lot of them are pretty easy to obey. <laughs> Don't murder. Okay, man, I'm on a roll. I've got a 54-year streak of not murdering. <laughs> but how are we doing on this command? Rejoice always. Of course it's a command when you think about it. Or perhaps now that you are thinking about it, you realize that there's not a lot of other verses like this one, right? It's so direct. It's a clear command, and then it's repeated for emphasis. Paul says, I'll say it again. You know, earlier I listed an entire list of things that Americans are stressing about. I mean, tomorrow, the Cowboys play the Giants. I say, rejoice. Why? Well, the Giants have two wins so far, that's true, but they've been quite flunky against poor competition. The Cowboys look decent this year despite having Cooper Rush at quarterback. They, they tend to have New York's number. But even with the Giants on a winning streak, I take the Cowboys against the spread in week three. What about you? What do you have to rejoice about? John 15, 15, Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You are Jesus' friend. That is something to rejoice about. What does it mean to be a friend of Jesus? Jesus has to be the ultimate friend, right? He gave his life for us. He gave his love for us. And now it's our turn. We get to be Jesus' friend back. We get to love one another as he loved us. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. You are the bride of Christ. What do you have to be joyful about? You are the bride of Christ. Believers in Jesus Christ, we are his bride and we wait for that great day when he returns, when we will be reunited with our bridegroom. And until that day, we stay faithful to him. John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You are a child of God. What do you have to be joyful about? You are a child of God. Being a child of God means you have access to the throne of grace. Through prayer, at any time, you, you have the promise that you'll receive mercy and find grace in, in times of need. The child of God trusts that their heavenly father will supply all their needs according to the riches of Jesus Christ. The child of God is confident in the father of heaven to give good gifts to those who ask of him. What is God trying to tell you? Of course you have a reason to rejoice, right? Because of those three titles that you have, those are all indicators that the God of the universe, right? The God of the universe wants a relationship with you. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. What a great command. Yes, it is. But it is a hard passage to obey. Fortunately, there's more here for us in the passage if we just keep reading. Verse five, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. Now, my passage says reasonableness. Your passage might say gentleness. It could also mean uh, what's appropriate. What's appropriate? It means 
how you act, how you act correctly. Acting joyful as a child of God is appropriate. Being joyful as a bride is appropriate. My youngest son was out in the street this week uh, playing with the other neighborhood kids. They were swinging each other around on the grass and riding bikes and riding scooters and chasing each other and playing hide and seek, you know, with no cares, no worries. They were joyful. That's how it should be. They were acting reasonable. They were acting appropriate for their age. One of, my, uh, one of our, Joanna and I, students from youth ministry got married this week. This is Gabby. Her smile as a bride, that carefree feeling she has in this moment, it's appropriate. A bride in love, the gentleness, the reasonableness is evident on her face. A Christian who is joyful, that's appropriate. And Paul says, let it be evident. Let it be known to everyone. The joy that the Christian wears daily should be seen. It should be obvious. Remember last week we said it should be obvious, right? Obvious like a joyful bride. Obvious like a smiling child. Paul says, rejoice so much that everyone who is near you sees you. And it will remind them. Everyone who sees you will know the Lord is near. And what comes next? Another passage that we know, and another passage that is hard to follow. Verse 6, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. That means when you leave this place today, church, when you leave this place, you are never going to worry again for the rest of your life. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> but why not? Why doesn't it work? If you give it all to God, you shouldn't have to worry. Don't you believe that God is capable of resolving everything? And if that's true, why, why do you worry? Martin Luther, the great reformer, went through a pretty serious time of depression in his life. The Pope was trying to kill him. Uh, his friends had disowned him. His, his cause was languishing, and he was sunk pretty low, and he was discouraged. And one day his wife came downstairs, and she was dressed all in black. She had put on her funeral clothes, and he asked her, who died? And she said, God died. And he was angry. Now his wife was an unbeliever. Who had convinced his wife of such a lie? And she answered, you did. By the way you've been acting, worry, fear, discouragement. I just assumed God must have died. In one of his most famous teachings, Jesus tells us not to worry. And he gives us the example of birds. He says, look around you. There are birds everywhere, and they are not stressing out. They don't even know how to worry, but somehow they eat. They don't have a savings plan. They don't rent storage sheds. There's no worms in their IRA, but they seem to do okay. How does that happen? Jesus says, because your heavenly Father feeds them. And look what Paul says. Look what Paul says will happen if I can learn to control my worry. Verse 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you can stop worrying, you can have peace. Of course, but you can have the peace that God has. You can have the joy that God has. I mean, why do we worry? Do you ever think about that? Like, why, why do we worry? We typically worry because we can't control the future. We can't control the outcome. We don't know what's going to happen, right? We're unsure. We don't know what's going to happen, so we worry about it. The Bible says we can have peace because God knows what's going to happen, right? God is all-knowing. So God knows everything. He's, he knows what's going to happen. So God doesn't worry. God doesn't worry because he knows the outcome of every situation. And the Bible says you 
can have that same peace. And the next thing Paul says is, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul says, sure, there is a lot to worry about in the world. If you wanted to, you could worry about lots of things. He says, but think about these things instead. And he gives us a good a measuring tool, right? When I, when I think about the things that I'm stressing about, I could just lift every single one of those things up individually and just ask of it. This is me worrying about something. Is this thing, is this honorable? Is, is this just? This thing that I'm worrying about, is it, is it pure? Is it praiseworthy? Paul instructs that those are the only things that my mind should be thinking about. Now, does that mean I just ignore all my problems, just close my eyes and, you know, put my hands over my ears and just completely lose sight of reality, just live with my head in the clouds, walking around, la, 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 without a care in the world? No, but it does mean that occasionally it's healthy to step back and actually get a bigger picture and to say, yes, this is my reality, but compared to eternity, compared to the cross of redemption, how does my life really fit in to this grander scale? I think with the right perspective, we'd see that there is nothing that you are going through in this life, in, in your little life, that when compared to eternity, compares to the kingdom of God, compares to the cross of redemption, the reality is this existence is so much bigger than your problems. My problems are actually pretty small when compared to the rest of the world. And the truth is, the more I dwell on my problems, the more I bring glory to my problems. And in the short time that I have here, my role as a follower of Christ is only to bring glory to him. That's it. And I know I'm not like other Texas pastors. I don't bring up politics very much. I know there are other pastors across the city who are very politically minded. And I know people get all worked up and excited when pastors take political stances, but I don't like to spend a lot of time dwelling on politics. And I'll tell you why. I've met a lot of Christians who are wrapped up in a political world, but most of their thoughts, most of their reflections, most of their attitudes, most of the stuff that is consuming their mind about Democrats or Republicans or liberals or conservatives, none of that fits into what I just read in verse 8. Most Christian political banter is not noble. It's not just. It's not pure. It's not lovely. It's not what is of good report. It's not praiseworthy. In fact, a lot of the political banter is downright hateful and hurtful and disgraceful. Paul is very direct here. He says, consider what you're thinking about. What, what is consuming your mind? And it doesn't have to be politics. It could be sports, right? It could be reality television. I gave you three reasons to be joyful. You're a friend of Jesus. You're the bride of Christ. You're a child of God. But if you need more than that, I can give you more. You can rejoice because of where you've come from and where you're going. And in case you've forgotten where you've come from, let me remind you, you were dead. The Bible says you were dead and you were bound in eternity heading towards darkness. You were on a track for eternal separation from God and there was nothing, nothing you could do about it. You were helpless. No good deeds, no buyout option, no, you know, under the table payment, end of story. Romans 7 says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's where you come from but look at where you're going. 
In 1 Timothy, it says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. That is the reason to have joy. You were chief among sinners, but now you have obtained mercy. And look at where you go from here. You can partner with a body of believers in a church who all desire to have an impact for eternity. You can identify the gifts that, and the passions that God has given you, and you can uniquely reach out and reach others for him. You have hope, you have a future, you have an eternal home. You want more reasons to celebrate? More reasons to have joy? You can celebrate and have joy because of what God has done and what God continues to do. You know, in a country where eight churches close their doors every single day, I think we should celebrate what God has done in our little neighborhood, in our community church. I mean, throughout its long history, the church has been a major source of social services like schooling and medical care and inspiration for arts and culture and philosophy and an influential player in politics and religion. The church strengthens families, it strengthens communities, it strengthens society as a whole. It significantly affects educational and job attainment. It reduces the incidence of such major social problems as out of wed wedlock birth and drug and alcohol addiction and crime and delinquency. And I tell you all of that because I want you to be fully aware. I want you to be completely sure that you understand that as, that as you sit here today, you are participating in what I firmly believe is the hope and the answer to advancing God's kingdom in the world. Through the church of Jesus, lives are being changed for eternity and filled with joy. You can find joy in who we are, who the church is, and who God is and who God always will be. It tells us in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And we know from his word that he is the Alpha, he is the Omega, he is the author of life, he is the protector of faith, the bread of God, the living water, the spotless lamb and our risen savior. He is the princess, prince of peace. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, king of kings, lord of lords. He is our teacher, our shepherd, our physician, our master, our salvation. He is a refuge for the oppressed. He is a shelter for the storm. He is the source of strength, a stronghold in times of trouble, a fortress of salvation and a forgiving God. He is an architect. He is a builder. He is father to the fatherless, chosen and precious, faithful and true, holy and anointed, merciful and forgiving, wisdom and guidance, mercy and strength. And in the midst of all of life's trials, and tribulations, testings, and frustrations, we can still celebrate who God is. And we can find joy in who God will always be. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Lord of Lords. Friends, this is why we can rejoice. But what if I'm not a smiling person? <laughs> I, I see you. I'm one of you. I'm one of you. I have a pretty stoic face. My face, at rest, looks like I'm always thinking or mad. But the truth is, it's just my face. And I get it. Maybe you see the bubbly cashier or the, the high-kicking cheerleader and you think to yourself, yeah, but that's, that's not me. I'm not an outgoing person. I'm not an expressive person. We think we're not expressive. We think we're not charismatic. You ever heard that descriptor of a church? That that church is charismatic? What does that usually mean? It means they shout amen, right? When the pastor is talking. It means they smile. It means they raise their hands when they sing. It means, uh, it means they worship with excessive joy. You know what I wish? I wish that 
charismatic, that word, was not only a descriptor of some churches. Let me ask you, how many of you have ever gone to a Texans game or any other sporting event for that matter, an Astros game? And, and, and when they say, and now you're Houston Astros, you stood up, you applauded as loud as you know how. You, you have the jersey and the hat and the foam finger. I know some of you have done that watching a sports game. You probably do it even at home. So don't say it's not your personality to not stand or to not applaud greatness. Because isn't our God great? How many of you have ever gone to see your kids, your grandkids, at their soccer game or their little league game, and you made a complete fool of yourself shouting and encouraging them. Don't say it's not your personality to let loose in front of other people or to embarrass yourself. Our God is worth letting loose for. Our God is worth embarrassing ourselves for. How many of you have ever watched a movie or a TV show or a commercial, saw a story in the news or you read about it online or in a newspaper and you found yourself welling up with tears and choked up and emotionally moved as you watched it? Don't say it's not your personality to be emotional and swayed by a dynamic story. The story of our risen Savior is as dynamic as it gets. Psalm 95 says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Psalm 98 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Just charismatic churches? No. All the earth. All the earth. Just young people? No. All the earth earth. Your celebration might look different than mine. We're unique, but don't use uniqueness as an excuse. Don't fall back on some personality disclaimer to, to keep from giving God his due. Live a life of celebration. Live a life of worship. Live a life of joy. There's an old saying in church growth. It goes something like this. If you start a fire in your church, People will come to watch you burn. Let's start a fire of celebration. Let's be a congregation marked for joy. A body of believers that are finding ourselves constantly overwhelmed by where we've come from and where we are going. By what God has done. By what God is doing but most of all, full of joy and celebration for who God is and who he will always be. You know, we always close our services at Walden Church with the doxology. Uh, we have a 9.30 service. It's traditional. We sing hymns. We have a choir. Uh, we're going to sing all the songs that you grew up with. We have uh, communion. We say the Lord's Prayer. We do responsive readings. It's going to feel like traditional church for you. And at the end, we do. We sing the doxology. We sing it sometimes very liturgical, right? Very serious. But consider the lyrics of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What is the theme? Praising God. Right? Praise Him, the song says. Praise Him, everyone. Praise Him for all the good things of this earth. And all the earth praises Him. And all the heavens praise Him. Praise God. Praise God. God. Praise God. Join me in prayer. Lord, we do praise you. 
We praise you for where we have come from, where we are going. We praise you because we are your friends, we are your children, we are the bride. We praise you for what you've done and what you will always do. We praise you for the work of your church. Lord, may your Christians never stop praising your name, never stop smiling, never stop showing this world joy. May all your churches start fires. May they all sing and shout and clash cymbal. May they be people who show the world the beauty of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus. May your church attract more and more. May every knee bow and may every tongue confess. Praise God, praise God, praise God. You who are holy, you who are just, you who are merciful, you who are Lord, Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. And that's really how I want to close. I would invite you, go and seek out and attend your local church. We can't do church like this. Church has to be with other people, shoulder to shoulder, side by side, working together, we have to stop fearing, stop worrying, and we need to start advancing and start praising, start bringing glory. Throw all of your worry and care up and know that he has got it. Just as he cares for the birds of the air, he will care for you. Worship God at your local church. Praise God at your local church. Find joy and acceptance at your local church. And then partner with them. Partner with that local church. Use the talents and gifts that God has given you to serve. God has equipped you in a unique way that no one else is equipped. Maybe you've never thought about it, but you can teach Sunday school. Maybe you've never thought about it, but you could lead a Bible study. Maybe you've never thought about it, but you can serve people in your community. You can be a minister to your women's group. You can be a minister to your men's group. You can serve on your church board as a deacon or an elder. Your church needs you. The local church needs you to volunteer. They don't just need you to attend. Of course, we all like churches full. They don't just need you to give. Of course, we all like having our bills paid. But most of all, the kingdom of God needs you. Joyful people, serving people. You're never too young, you're never too old. Use the gifts that God has given you. Bring more joy to the world. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.